Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and those of us who are joining us uh, from uh, their homes or their offices online, wherever you are, you're all very welcome to this absolutely beautiful room here in the Royal Irish Academy uh, for this spectacular event, the uh, IUA National Three Minute Thesis Final. My name is Jonathan McRae. I'm delighted to be your MC for this afternoon. And we are, um, we're being overlooked by these amazing busts. These were um, uh, ordered by Lord Charlemont, who is the founder of the RIA, and uh, they were made in 1755 and uh, donated by the grandson of Charlemont. And, and I want you to pay your uh, attention to this. Apologies to those of you at home, but this is the, uh, the bust of Minerva, the Roman goddess uh, of wisdom, justice, and victory, which I think is a very, very um, apt a bust to be uh, looking down this, this afternoon. Uh, so really looking forward to this competition. It's always great to see young uh, researchers talking and communicating about their research. If you know anything about me, this is my life. I, I spend a lot of time helping people communicate their research. So I'm really excited to hear uh, about your great work. Um, we have eight contestants here. We're going to be hearing all about their research. Uh, just a note for those of you online, um, we do have live closed caption today, so they can be adjusted to suit you. Uh, that should be on the screen in front of you. So this three-minute three thesis uh, concept was originally developed um, by the University of Queensland, and the idea is uh, to support graduate research students in finding their voice to talk about their research, because uh, if, if, we, if we don't communicate the importance of our research, if we don't explain why we are doing what we're doing, uh, then uh, we can uh, get into problems. We, we don't get people on, on board with our ideas. The public wonder, why are we funding this sort of thing? And collaborators can't, uh, can't see what we're doing and build on it. Um, so these participants are, are, are facing a very difficult challenge. So uh, you might know there's quite a bit of work that goes into a PhD, and uh, they're expected to reduce their work into just three minutes using only one slide. And they have to aim it to a non-specialist general audience. So everyone should be able to understand this, despite the fact that there's a lot of intense research and sometimes quite niche and technical details. That's the idea. Uh, our judging panel will be judging on clarity and content, and they'll be deciding the overall winner and runner-up. And the audience here in the room and on Zoom will also get to vote. I will get into that in a few minutes. Uh, but first, I'm delighted to introduce our fantastic uh, judging panel today, each of them drawing on their own personal expertise uh, in the areas of research and communication and leadership. Uh, they are Dr. Orla Quinn, who's an independent non-executive director and former secretary general at the Department of Enter Enterprise, Trade and Employment. Uh, Professor Philip Nolan, uh, Nolan uh, director general of Science Foundation Ireland. Uh, Jenny Darmody, who is the editor of Silicon Republic, a publication that covers, of course, a lot of research in Ireland and abroad. Uh, Danny McCoy, who is CEO of IBEC, and our chair of the judging panel is Jim Miley. He's Director General of the IUA. Our finalists today are the winners or runners-up in their individual university competition. So they have already uh, excelled at, at this competition, so we're expecting great things of them. Uh, today they're going to compete to be the national champion. They are Victoria Ward from the University of Galway, Sergei Katsuba from the University College Dublin, Maeve Kennedy from DCU, uh, Astrid Didieu from University College Cork, Bill Calvi from Maynooth University, Leanne Shanley from Trinity, Murray Gallagher from TU Dublin, and Patrick Dolan from University of Limerick. So if you're ready, we'll get this final underway. So each competitor has their own turn to present. They have a three minute clock. It's right here, it's in big red letters, because if they go over, they will be disqualified. It's really, really tight, this competition. Um, we will let, that know, let them know if they've been disqualified later on, uh, but we don't interrupt these presentations because we know so much work has gone into them. So let's get going. Uh, please welcome our first uh, participant. She is Victoria Ward. Victoria, can you join me on stage, please? So, Victoria is um, a PhD researcher at the School of Medicine in University College Galway, and her presentation today is Healing Hearts with Hyaluronic Acid Hydrogels. Did yeah, I pronounce that correctly? Absolutely, yes. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Victoria, uh, just to reiterate, when you say slide, please, that's when your three minutes start. Sure. You must complete but before the three minutes. All yeah. right? You clear? Yeah. Okay. The stage is yours. Slide, please. Feel your heart. It's steadily beating, constantly active, always responsible. Our biological engine. Over my 26 years, my heart has clocked over 9 million beats, and I hope for many more. However, after a heart attack, each beat becomes precious, 
as blocked blood vessels starve tissue of oxygen, causing death, damage and weakness. Under these circumstances, the walls which normally drive blood through the organ now struggle to pump efficiently. The engine fails. Without intervention, clinical heart failure sets in. And when our hearts fail, so does the rest of our body. While current treatments aim to alleviate symptoms and prevent disease reoccurrence, the persistent issue of wall weakening remains. Medical progress in this field is lacking, and with heart failure an undesirable consequence of wall weakening, my research is centered on finding a support, a solution. I believe that hyaluronic acid hydrogels are the answer to heal our hearts. Hyaluronic acid is a natural material found within our own body, which is currently used as injection therapies to support and stabilize damaged joint regions. I recognize hyaluronic acid's capabilities. Its success acting in mechanically demanding environments and set out to translate its application for the heart. However, hyaluronic acid is present as a fluid which isn't suitable for the heart. So I increased its strength and supportive nature by forming it into a hydrogel, which is a soft, jelly, squishy-like material. I achieved this by designing a unique mixer and combining clever chemistries to convert liquid hyaluronic acid into a hydrogel mimicking heart tissue, a new generation of localized mechanical therapy. And once these hydrogels were formed, I tested their mechanical and biological limits to ensure they could integrate into the heart. Constantly beating, steady and now responsible. My research has created soft tissue supports. So after a heart attack, by combining clinically available catheters with my hydrogel solution means that the walls of the heart are supported. No longer weakened, no longer threatened with failure. These hydrogels have a platform to also help improve the local delivery of therapeutic cells and drugs into the heart, creating a comprehensive solution for our biological engines. I understand the devastating impact of heart disease today and will continue to research it to save every precious beat. Thank you. Wow. Fantastic talk, absolutely amazing, a great way to start. So um, I know that uh, interdisciplinary work is, uh, is important to you. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. Why do you think it's so important to, to have disciplines talk to each other when we're talking about research like this? I think in my circumstances anyway, I came from an anatomical background. So while I had fantastic knowledge on how the heart works, understanding the importance of these biomaterials and how they can actually integrate as heart tissue with something where communicating with the likes of engineers and material scientists uh, was vital. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Victoria. Thank you. All right, next up is Sergei Katsuba. Sergei, if you can join me on stage, please. Sergei is a PhD researcher at the Sunderland, Sutherland School of Law in University College Dublin. His presentation title today is Institutional Discrimination as an Author Authoritarian, Authoritarian Practice, a Case of Russia. We're really looking forward to this. Sergei, the floor is yours. Remember, your time starts when you say slide, please. Uh, slide, please. It's never easy to talk about my research. When introducing my research to the audience, I often ask a question. If you were from Russia, what would be the last thing you'd want to study? And this is the topic of my research. I study hate crimes against LGBTQ individuals in Russia. And particularly, I am interested in how government policies affect the level of those crimes. 10 years ago, in June 2013, Russia introduced legislation that was commonly referred to as the gay propaganda law. This legislation restricted LGBTQ people in their rights, and it had adverse societal effects. It increased the level of hate crimes. A hate crime is a criminal offense motivated by prejudice towards a social group. In minds of perpetrators, this social group does not belong. It is a flaw in the order of things that must be fixed. 
In Russia, this prejudice is encouraged by the authorities, and this provoked a chain reaction when hundreds of people around the country decided to kill gay people. After all, killing someone is a way to restore the order of things. The purpose of the research um, was to prove it wrong. The authorities say, we don't have those kinds of people here. We don't have any gays. You cannot kill those who don't exist. In order to prove it wrong, we created a database of hate crime cases, which included more than 1,000 cases. Those are the real crimes and real people who do exist. Um, we have hard evidence, we have proof of harm that discriminatory legislation does to people's lives. Since the government does not monitor those crimes, we are the only source of reliable information. It will inform better policies when the time and conditions are right in this particular place on planet Earth. Thank you. Amazing research, Sergey, and, and so important. Can you tell me a little bit about the uh, online website and mm. artwork that you're developing as a result of this project, mm. please? So, yeah, basically we were searching all the criminal cases available for the public to find the hate crimes there. We were digging into it and finding those cases that were not visible for the media, for the public, for the NGOs, and then we created this database and we decided to publish it so that it is available to everybody, basically. So we developed the website dedicated to this, and all the cases will be published there in a timely manner. Sergey, thanks very much. Looking forward to yeah. chatting to you more later on. Um, Sergey Katsuba. OK, we now invite Maeve Kennedy to the stage. Uh, Maeve is in her third year as a PhD researcher at the School of Chemical Sciences in Dublin City University. Her presentation title today is Little Needles, Big Job, How We Plan to Destroy Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria. Again, Maeve, your time starts when you say slide, please. Thank you very much. OK, slide, please. Hi, so my name is Maeve Kennedy. And my research project aims at fighting antibiotic resistance by creating antibacterial surfaces using nanotechnology. So what do all those buzzwords mean? So to give context to my research, an everyday example can be found in surgical implants. So for example, if a person was to receive a hip replacement or a knee replacement, they're generally given uh, broad spectrum antibiotics to ensure that they don't get a bacterial infection after that surgery. If that person was to get a bacterial infection, that the antibiotics can't fight, that's when a massive, massive problem can arise. And that's what my research aims to solve. So in general, antibiotics work by chemically breaking down bacteria. We want to create surfaces that can cover implants like a hip replacement, and they have the ability to kill bacteria themselves. In this way, we can attack bacteria in a more targeted approach and rely less on antibiotics as the sole source for killing bacteria. I'm particularly interested in looking at how to create these surfaces in the most effective and efficient manner. So as I've said, uh, antibiotics work by chemically breaking down bacteria, whereas the surfaces that I make aim to kill bacteria in a completely different way. They do so with really, really tiny needles. So this research has been inspired by nature, um, and it's been found that on many different insects, like a cicada, as I have above me, or a dragonfly wing, there are nanostructures on the surface of the wing. In that case, when bacteria lands on the surface of the wing, it's been shown that the bacteria dies because of interaction with these structures. So in my lab, I create these needles that are 100 times smaller than the width of a single strand of hair, and we call them nanoneedles. These nanoneedles aim to kill bacteria, as I've said, very differently to antibiotics. They aim to either tear bacterial cells apart or puncture them or cause them to self-destruct. I'm really interested in creating an entire library of these nanoneedles, all with different properties. So whether that be water absorbent or repellent, uh, positively or negatively charged, or having different levels of elasticity. The reason I'm interested in all of these different properties is to firstly better understand how the nanoneedles are specifically killing bacteria, and to secondly understand how can I make the most effective surface to kill bacteria. My research project isn't aimed at replacing the need for antibiotics altogether, rather offering a more targeted approach to attack bacteria that are no longer affected by the antibiotics that we have available today. 
In this way, we're hoping to reduce the burden that is placed on our healthcare sector by antibiotics resistance. Thank you. Very cool. Congratulations, mate. Brilliant talk. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the, the needles in a bit, but um, yeah. through a PhD, you learn a lot of different skills. You learn your, you know, your technical skills, and you also learn softer. Some people call them power skills. How, how, how many of those have you accumulated over the, the last while, and, and are, are they important, do you think? The power skill, yeah, for sure. I mean, this is a great example of a power skill, is learning to do this um, and talk about the research. And it's great, I was saying to other competitors today as well, it's like, the more I get into this research, and like you were saying, the more nuanced I get, and the more I can see myself tunneling down a dark hole that I really care about, but generally my mom is like, uh, it doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> I don't understand what you're talking about. So this is a great challenge to remind yourself of the importance of your research and how key it is to be able to explain it to the general public because they are the people funding what we do. Maeve, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Maeve Kennedy, everyone. All right. Um, we are trucking along. Next up is Astrid Didier. Astrid, if you could join me on stage, please. Astrid is researching in the field of marine ecology at the Society of Biological, Environmental and Earth Science at University College Cork. Her presentation title today is Identifying and Mitigating the Impact of Offshore Wind Farms on Seabirds Breeding in Ireland. A very important subject. Uh, Astrid, once again, your time starts when you say slide, please. The very best of luck. Astrid. Okay, slide please. If I tell you to think about seabirds, your first thought might be of that pesky gull that nicked your chips one day, or the emperor penguin seen on telly plodding along on the ice. But there is a multitude of other species, and Ireland hosts a great diversity of them. Now, unsurprisingly, seabirds are in decline globally, mainly due to human activities such as bycatch from fisheries or plastic pollution. Now, recently, offshore wind farms have added themselves onto that list. Humans have introduced giant aerial structures in a seemingly flat landscape, at least from a seabird's perspective, we think. And the impact of these structures, which are crucial in our fight against climate change, are still greatly understudied. So, during my PhD, I will identify the preferred feeding grounds of Atlantic puffins breeding in Ireland, and thanks to advanced mathematical modeling techniques, of which I will spare you the details, don't worry, I'll make predictions as to how future offshore wind farms may impact these areas, and therefore, the birds that depend on them. To identify these areas, we've been equipping our puffins with tiny GPS trackers that allow us to retrace their journeys from their breeding colonies to their feeding grounds. Imagine that you walked into your house with muddy shoes and you left footprints all over the place, but the prints seem to be concentrated in the kitchen area. Scientists could suppose, given the amount of time that you spent walking around in there and the state of the kitchen, that you fixed yourself something to eat. And it's the exact same with our puffins. If the tracks show them circling around and spending a lot of time in an area, we can hypothesize that the area is of interest to them and potentially rich in food resources, i.e. fish for these guys. Um, now, to put things into perspective, um, imagine you're back in your house and you're feeling a bit peckish, so you head to the fridge for a wee snack. But in between you and the fridge stands a giant turbine with the potential to grind you into mulch. What do you do? Do you try your luck and go straight through like Ninja Warrior style? Or do you try to go around it, even if it means wasting more time and energy having to circle around the whole house? Tough decision to make, right? Especially when you're a little bird and your life depends on it. So over the course of my thesis, I will try to answer a few questions, you'd hope so. Um, such as, what is the risk of a bird actually colliding with one of these turbines? Or, what would happen to our puffin populations should the areas covered in turbines be entirely lost to them? My results will contribute to finding solutions before the construction of these wind farms to minimize their impact on the environment in order to promote the development of renewable energies in a sustainable way, which is what we need to achieve the Irish government's very ambitious targets, by the way. So, to finish off uh, this little spiel of mine, I guess, my final question to you is, if I tell you to think about seabirds now, what would your first thought be? Thank you for listening. Excellent, Astrid. So, so in the course of, uh, of doing your work, um, your field work in particular, interesting things happen when you're outside of the lab. Can you tell me what happened with these sandwich turns, please? Oh, um, they, didn't, they chose not to cooperate. Um, <laughs> what does that mean? They outsmarted us quite a bit. 
Um, so if we had actually observed them a bit more before, we might have figured that the way that they move is very consistent. And if we change the opening of something relative to the way that they're going into it, they might not. And so it was, it was a bit nerve-wracking um, just to see a bird with your tag on it, deciding not to go back to its nest. Um, <laughs> so yeah. you sort of lost a few birds. A few tags. A few tags. Yeah, okay. the birds are okay. still fine. We birds, think. Okay, good. Okay. God, we that, hope. Could have, that could have gone anywhere there. Yeah. Uh, Astrid, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank Cheers. Um, okay. <laughs> we now have Bill Calvi. Uh, Bill, if you can join me on stage, please. Bill is a PhD researcher with the Hamilton Institute at Maynooth University. Uh, his presentation today is Still Feeling Healthy After All These Years The Identification of Health Optimistic and Pessimistic Older Adults. Bill, your time starts when you say slide, please. The best of luck. Last year I was at my friend's house for dinner and his father, John, was scrolling on his phone about reading an article that said that eating processed meats every day increases your risk of getting colorectal cancer when you're an older adult. Now, John is, is an interesting man um, because he started freaking out. He loves steak, he loves sausages, but to calm himself down he went outside for a cigarette. Um, See, older adults are at the greatest risk of having an overly optimistic or pessimistic perception of their health, despite the, the detrimental physical, functional, and mental health consequences. But very few ways of identifying these individuals exist. My research rectifies this. I've created a metric called health asymmetry, which can pinpoint certain individuals who might be at risk of being overly optimistic or pessimistic about their health. And how do we achieve this? Well, using data collected by the Irish government and different research bodies, we retrieve someone's subjective perception of their health, ranging from poor to excellent. It's like me asking Professor Philip Nolan how healthy he thinks, and we compare that to your object of health, so how healthy you are defined by the healthcare system, frailty, medical tests, and observations. And depending on the distance between someone's subjective and their object of health, will determine which category they're classified in. So, for example, if John said that his health was poor, but actually he turned out to be quite healthy, He's health pessimistic. But if the converse was true, and John said that his health was excellent, but he engages in risky behaviors, he has an acute condition that he's not aware of, he's health optimistic. But our research finds that about 68 to 70% of older Irish adults somewhere lie in the middle and are health realistic, meaning that we're pretty good at pinpointing our health status. But now we've data which tracks people's health perceptions across years. So we can ask some really important public health questions. We know that health pessimists have heightened depressive symptoms, but health optimists are more likely to trip, fall, and in acquire an injury in their natural environment. But health pessimists have a shorter life expectancy. So no matter what context we look at in terms of health, there are negative outcomes for both health pessimists and optimists. What we do know is that promoting a healthy dose of realism somewhere in between has the best health outcomes for all. So it's not the steaks, not the sausages, not the skateboards that will kill you most likely. But by taking someone's subjective health into account in GPs and practice, along with their objective health, we can identify certain individuals who might be at risk of some pretty not nice outcomes. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. I'm wondering where I sit in the age thing, whether I'm in this bracket yet or not. I don't um, want to tell you. Yeah, actually, maybe, maybe we won't do that in front of the audience. Um, you learned to code during this um, yes. uh, work. Tell me a little bit about that. What, what, how did you do that? It was horrible. So um, I came from a background in psychology, and then suddenly I thought it would be a good idea to become a data scientist with no coding skills. So I had to teach myself uh, during the pandemic. Um, and it was just through engaging with my peers in class, asking them, how do I do this? How do we do that? And over the last couple of years, I've built up that uh, skill set, which is now one of the most valuable things I've learned in my PhD. OK, phenomenal. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to chat to you more about the research in a bit. But uh, Bill, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. All right, uh, next up is Leanne Shanley. Leanne, if you can join me on stage, please. Leanne is a PhD researcher uh, at the School of Biochemistry and Immunology at Trinity College Dublin. Her presentation title today is Read the Instructions, Teaching Your Immune Systems to Grow a New You. Uh, as ever, Leanne, your time starts when you say slide, please. OK, thank you. Slide 
slide, please. This is an axolotl. Kind of cute, no? Well, what if I were to tell you that this axolotl has mastered a complex skill that has evaded humans for all of medical history? He can regrow his own limbs and organs. When we try and do this, we encounter a whole host of problems. These include scarring, non-union of bone fractures, or complete loss of function at an injury site. So this begs the question, why do we, the most complex organisms on the planet, fail to do what comes to this little axolotl so innately? Well, the answer lies in something many of us here will have been very familiar with hearing about, particularly over the past few years, our immune system. We humans have evolved an incredibly complex immune system, and this has allowed us to survive in, adapt to, and dominate a world in which we are constantly under attack by pathogens such as bacteria and viruses. Yet, as you can see from this graph, this immune complexity has come at a cost. The more complex an organism is, the more complex their immune system is. However, the more complex our immune systems are, the less capacity we have to regenerate functional tissue. So now, science and medicine have turned to seek outside help in the form of biomaterials. A biomaterial is any material intended for use within the human body, and these comprise the likes of your hip replacements, your heart valves, even certain nanoparticles that can go into a vaccine and help enhance your immune response, hopefully not imparting any 5G on the side. Your immune system is capable of not only seeing these materials, but reading them and responding to them. And in this, we can now view biomaterials as a type of language with which we can communicate with your immune system. My PhD is focused on looking at aspects of biomaterial design in order to engineer a pro-regenerative immune environment. In particular, I have looked at particles that coat biomaterial implants as the first surface your immune system is going to see when a material is in your body, and I've seen that simply by tuning the size of these particles, I can differentially instruct your immune cells to use different energy pathways. And when they use these different pathways, they can then perform different functions. In essence, I can write a letter to your immune system via particles and tell it to dampen down inflammation and enhance growth. Now, science is a while away just yet, but we are moving towards a future in which biomaterial intervention will not just be a temporary solution, but will provide your immune system with a long-term instruction manual so you can learn to grow an entirely new you, much like our little axolotl. Thank you. Well done, Leanne. Um, you know, doing a PhD takes a certain type of person, I think. It's a long slog. You know, you do need certain traits or characteristics. What do you think they are? If you, if you want to do a PhD, what do you think you need as a trait? I definitely think, and this is something that does develop over time, resilience uh, is a huge factor in doing a PhD. I think it's very easy to go in with the mindset of, oh, things will work out and everything will go smoothly and at the end. But uh, the reality is, more often than not, you'll encounter failures. And they just are part and parcel of the experience and part and parcel of doing the PhD. And it's very important to learn to take those with the wins and just um, learn how to use them to your advantage or to learn from them. So resilience would definitely be up there for me. Did, did you have a particularly hard day or was it a particularly difficult? Well, I think the laughter would probably say a lot of people understand <laughs> all of the days, that All of the days. A lot of the days. And yeah, it's yeah. the nature of science. You're asking questions that the answer is either yes or no, and you're hoping for the yes, and it's difficult when you get the no, but you need to learn to just take that as, as part of it all. Leanne, thanks very much. Thank okay. Um, Mairead Gallagher is up next. Uh, Mairead, if you can join me on stage, please. She's in her fourth year as a PhD researcher at the School of Chemical and Biopharmaceutical Sciences at TU Dublin. Her presentation today is Synthesis of the Metabolites of Common Antibiotics and the Investigation of Their Role in the Development of Antimicrobial Resistance. Leanne, your time starts when you say slide, please. The best of luck. Oh, I'm sorry, you. Mairead, sorry. You're fine. <laughs> Mairead, <yeah. laughs> Slide, please. Everyone in this room has taken an antibiotic at some stage in your lives, but have you ever thought about what happens after you're better? When we take antibiotics, their chemical structures get broken down in our bodies to make them easier to get rid of, producing compounds called metabolites. 
Antibiotics given to farm animals will go through a similar process. The metabolites of antibiotics have really similar structures to the antibiotics they come from. Some of them can still even kill bacteria. After removal, antibiotics and their metabolites can be found in wastewater treatment plants, hospital effluent, and agricultural runoff. And from here, they can enter our environment. When bacteria get exposed to small amounts of antibiotics, they can become resistant to them, meaning that more higher doses of the antibiotic is needed to kill the bacteria. Bacteria in the environment may be encountering small amounts of metabolites, and my research is investigating whether this exposure could be helping the bacteria to learn how to fight the parent antibiotics too. If it is, and these bacteria then re-enter our food chain and infect us, higher doses of antibiotics will be needed to cure our infections, and so the cycle will keep repeating. So how have we investigated this? Well, firstly, I've made a number of the main human metabolites of three very commonly prescribed antibiotics from three different antibiotic classes, all of which have been detected in the environment previously. So far, I've conducted studies where I've exposed a bacterial species to a metabolite for a period of 30 days, and then I've tested for signs of resistance. Bacteria can produce a type of defensive shield called a biofilm, and biofilms make it harder for antibiotics to attack the bacteria. This graph shows a biofilm formation result from one of my studies. In it, I'm seeing increased biofilm formation in bacteria that I exposed to a metabolite for 30 days, shown as the green bar on the left, compared to a bacteria that was grown for the same amount of time but was never exposed to the metabolite. So why does this matter? Well, in this study, I've exposed one strain of bacteria to one metabolite. In the environment, biofilms would contain multiple different species of bacteria, and they'd come into contact with other antibiotics and their metabolites, heavy metals, other pharmaceutical drugs, microplastics. These can promote stressful conditions and can promote biofilm formation. I'm seeing increased biofilm formation in ideal conditions. So what could be happening in the environment that we don't know about yet? Globally, a One Health approach recognizes that animal, human, and environmental health are all interlinked. So to reduce resistance rates, collective action is being taken globally to, um, across these sectors. If my research shows that antibiotic metabolites do influence resistance in bacteria, we may need to re-examine existing One Health policies. Thank you. Thanks, Brave. Thank um, so uh, tell us a little bit about the flash talk and poster presentation that you got to do in the summer and how that came about, please. Uh, so I was over in Oxford um, at the Royal Society of Chemistry's International Symposium, and I had um, secured the Dr. Neil Russell Research Bursary Award to actually get the attendance for this conference. And it was just the most amazing experience uh, walking through Oxford and meeting with people across the organic synthesis kind of world in the UK and abroad and seeing Donna Blackman from the Scripps Institute particularly. <laughs> she's like my hero. Swoon. Like, oh my God, yeah, no, definite, definite. She was amazing. Just seeing the, the world-class research happening and making friends with other researchers from Oxford and from Manchester and Germany just to show how far you can go with research and where it can bring you. Yeah, it's a, it's a really wonderful place, particularly during the summer in Oxford, oh, where all these yeah. um, people come together from all around the world. Mairead, thank you very much. The best of luck. Uh, okay, that's Mairead. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, we have Patrick Dolan. Patrick, if you could join me on stage, please. He is a PhD researcher with the School of Education and Health Science at the University of Limerick. His presentation title today is Thousands of Resources for a Few Dozen Players, Yet Thousands of Players Have No Resources. Patrick. Thank you. Remember, your time starts when you say slide, please. Right. <clears throat> slide, please. The boys in green, your Six Nations champions and number one team in the world. Okay, so my speech didn't age quite as well as we all would have liked since April, but they're still our favorite team in the world. The hard work put in during a rugby match is undeniable. The willingness of players to lay their bodies on the line for their team, for their country, that's a sense of pride we spectators love to feel. But win or lose, the result is a product of much more than those 80 minutes alone. 
Specialists work around the clock to prepare players for the brutal demands of the game. These physiotherapists and strength and conditioning coaches use a wide array of resources to help players perform their best while reducing their risk of injury. But what about the rest of us? What do we have access to? What about the moms and dads who want to continue to play the sport they love, hold down a full-time job, and still be able to keep up with the little ones at home? The number of us participating in community sport is far greater than those at the professional level. Yet with a complete imbalance of resources, these injuries are impacting our daily lives. Nowadays, I wear a researcher's coat, but for the last 10 years, I've worn my coaching hat, so I'm determined to do something about this. Community rugby here in Ireland has reported higher overall injury rates compared to similar cohorts internationally, but I needed to know what types of injuries were occurring. So I went out and I monitored injuries across 25 clubs across the country and discovered what parts of the body were most susceptible to injury. So clearly there was some room for improvement, but what resources were available currently in the community? Well, after interviewing players and coaches at this level, I had the key insights necessary to design not only a feasible intervention, but one they'd actually want to use. It was time to put my practical skills to the test. I designed a program to be completed in less than 15 minutes, does not use equipment, and does not require expert, often expensive consultation of physios. In an eight-month nationwide control trial across 21 men's and women's clubs, I implemented this program and we found incredible results. The clubs that used my program, compared to those that didn't, saw 32% fewer severe injuries, 42% fewer non-contact injuries, those all too common knee and shoulder ligament sprains, 60% less, and 77% fewer hamstring strains. But the most important finding was that the clubs found the program easy and enjoyable to implement, with compliance playing a huge role in these positive clinical outcomes. So whether you play rugby, your grandkids play soccer, or you coach a GAA team, I encourage you to engage with Engage. Thank you. Pachi, that's uh, phenomenal and, and, and really Im impressive statistics. Um, why is it exciting for you to be involved in women's and, as well as men's teams? You, you, you're involved in both of those, right? Yeah, so I suppose um, the more I got involved in the research side, I uh, used to coach in, on the industry side for about 10 years back in the States, and you always see resources you know, firsthand, maybe lack a little bit or coming across budget or equipment can always lack, but to be involved in research, you start to really see it on a large scale, not just in one sport, but, but globally, but then also um, to be, I suppose, part of one of the, the leading groups um, within Irish sport, there's certainly great work being done across uh, Camogie, Ladies Gaelic, uh, certainly within rugby, within our project, um, but to be one of those kind of um, leading research units to really try and make the game more equitable across genders has been really impactful for me. Patrick, everyone. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Wow. This has been a very, very impressive afternoon already. Eight spectacular speakers, and I do not envy the judges. I say that when I do all these competitions, but actually, I haven't picked a winner in my head, um, and it's up to our judges to do that. So um, it's going to be very tricky. Uh, I'm going to ask the judges to retire now and make your decisions as quickly as you possibly can, if that's OK. Uh, I know it's very difficult. Um, and for you uh, in the audience and, and those of you watching at home, you can also vote. And I would ask you to consider um, the goddess Minerva looking down upon us. And if you have a friend who is a speaker here, you tell them you definitely voted for them. But secretly, you vote for what you think the best talk was. Goes for you guys at home, right? These are tricky because they can be a bit partisan. In the audience vote, vote for what you think the best talk was for clarity and content. The way you do that is with Slido. So www.slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com. And on the home page, you'll see a blue box which asks if you're joining as a participant. Enter the code hashtag uh, 3714912 into that box. Um, while you are voting, and please do vote once and only once, um, we're going to show you a recap of our, our participants. Uh, so if we can roll the video, please. My name is Victoria Kirsten Ward, and my PhD is looking at strategies to mechanically stabilize the heart wall following a myocardial infarction. 
my research has a very personal drive to it. My mother was implanted with a defibrillator in order to keep her own heart ticking. My name is Sergei Katsuba. My thesis title is Institutional Discrimination as an Authoritarian Practice, a Case of Russia. We see violence against gay people in Russia as a product of autocratization and Russia becoming a dictatorship. In the future, we're hoping that the results and the outcome of our research can inform better policies in this place. My name is Maeve Kennedy. My thesis title is Mechanobactericidal Surfaces that Target Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria. So from a personal perspective, I had studied pharmaceuticals and I had studied medicinal chemistry and this was a way to use that degree and my interest in healthcare and improving the medical studies environment, but also in a way that was more tactile and applications focused. I'm Astrid de Dieu, and my thesis and three submission is entitled Identifying and Mitigating the Impacts of Offshore Wind Farm on Seabirds Breeding in Ireland. It gives me the opportunity to do research in something that is very relevant to the current climate crisis and biodiversity loss. Just grateful for the opportunity to contribute to fighting that. My name is Bill Calvi, and the title of my thesis is Still Feeling Healthy, the Identification of Health Optimistic and Health Pessimistic Older Adults. I began my PhD during the height of the pandemic and on a daily basis we were protecting our health, thinking critically about our health. So naturally I became interested in people's subjective perception about their health and how much that actually lined up with reality. My name is Leanne Shanley and the title of my thesis in three is Read the Instructions, Teaching Your Immune System to Grow a New You. I do feel that there is kind of a distance between what's done kind of under the covers of a research lab and what is actually made available to the public. So I'd love to be the link between basic scientific research and communicating why it's important or why it applies to you in general. I'm Mariah Gallagher and the title of my thesis in three submission is Synthesis of the Metabolites of Common Antibiotics and Investigation of Their Role in the Development of Antimicrobial Resistance. When you take an antibiotic, you don't necessarily think of what happens after you're better and what happens in the environment. I'm Patrick Dolan and the title of my thesis in three presentation is Thousands of resources for a few dozen players, yet thousands of players have no resources. I'm a coach at heart, uh, and to me, coaching is the balance of art and science. We are hoping to really try and improve both the health and safety of the game of rugby union, as well as hopefully improve their performance. All right, well, they are our eight participants. Please vote via Slido. Is anyone, everyone okay? You got through to Slido, okay? No issues? Yeah, so this details, everybody okay? Raise your hand if you're having a problem. Excellent, okay, good, because we had paper ballots, it was gonna be really messy. I'm glad we don't have to do that. Um, okay, so if I could get um, some of our participants up on stage, please. Can we have Victoria and uh, Maeve up, please? And Maraid and Sergey. Um, give them a round of applause. So we want to just uh, dig a bit deeper into the, the PhD experience and some of the research while we're waiting for our, um, our, our judges to make their decision. Um, and uh, Victoria, I know that um, teaching other students was, was an important part of this for you. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that process, please? Um, so I am involved in the University of Galway of teaching the medical students, so dissectional anatomy. Um, I think that's really important because the meds come in as these baby, baby doctors, uh, literally only filtering out of their secondary school years. So it's a completely different change of learning. Um, it's trying to bring the enthusiasm in as to, you know, the basics of anatomy and 
also, realistically, they will probably be our future surgeons. So if we can get them to learn in a way that's going to stay within their head and also just encourage them to keep down that path of, of research and medicine, because it's a tough one, um, that's really special to me. And I also like the idea that I am influencing future doctors. Do you have to have a very, um, a very good hand to be a, a I'd good I'd say steady, analysis? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and you can always tell, um, there's always a special maybe one person that I would always go up to and say, you will become a fantastic surgeon because the level of detail they go into uh, each dissection, I suppose, is something that with my six to eight years of experience haven't achieved myself. So um, we're hoping they're going to be our future doctors. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a great and teacher student experience for, for them as well to hear that and give that sense, sense of confidence. Maybe you also um, teach students, is that right? Yeah, I'm not to that, that same degree. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the chemistry lab, yeah, we're, we're teaching um, mainly first to fourth year students generally. So I supervise fourth years in my research group um, along with all of my colleagues. And then we also demonstrate for uh, the undergraduate students as well. But yeah, I, abs I absolutely love it. It's just a great way to get to chat to students. And I used to, my favorites I always say are to teach the first years just because they're so new to chemistry and like it's half a sales pitch to try and convince them to choose chemistry and half of it's just like picking up glassware that they've broken or whatever <laughs> but uh no it's great it's a great way to and it's, it's the same when a student comes up to me and asks me a question that i don't know the answer to i'm like oh you're gonna be my boss someday like that <laughs> this student knows exactly what they're doing so it's a great way to kind of get exposed to the next um, set of scientists coming through there's a lot of social commentary about young people uh you know and, and about the youth of today but um when you're you know teaching these young people do you feel that the future is in good hands oh yeah oh definitely yeah uh, there i that's it's a great way to because i think there is a lot of social commentary i think there's a lot of positive stuff coming out i think there's also obviously naturally a lot of negative stuff as well so i think getting to speak to um especially demonstrating in dcu just the, the wide range of students that come through the doors and like their different life experience and also then their different interests. So seeing them really struggle in one lab and then really then click with something or understand a concept in another and knowing that, okay, they feel a little bit better leaving today. Like some of them come in in the first day and they've never touched uh, even a chemistry book and they're in a chemistry lab now freaking out. And by the end of it, they've been convinced to do chemistry. And when you kind of see that and their own self-motivation, 100%, the the, you know, the future is safe in that kind of regard, I think. Very good. Um, Mairead, you know, part of doing a PhD is, you know, developing these skills. Um, mm. And I'm wondering, what, what sort of skills do you think you've developed along the way? Um, well, I think I'd go with Leanne earlier. Resilience, resilience is definitely top up there. Um, time organization, um, confidence. Like, doing something like this is a great way of trying to build up the confidence to disseminate your research and to tell people what's so important about what you do. And then I suppose the skills in the lab will be kind of say like flash column chromatography. Like they're kind of, they're more analytical skills. Yeah. Um, but they're also really transferable because there are, uh, I would um, teach students as well. I teach analytical chemistry. So I would be doing some of the work in my project that I then teach. So it's really beneficial and uh, I find it really, really helpful. Sergey, what about you in terms of, you know, the technical skills and the, the leadership skills or the social skills? What, what do you feel you've really developed over your work? Um, I suppose it's the ability to sort of create, a, set a goal for yourself, sort of create the image of academic life that you want to have in the future for your project, for, for your career. And the ability to, yeah, to pursue it, to, to, to go towards it. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about your um, research, because, you know, with uh, Putin, we're seeing um, sort of anti-LGBTQ sort of um, uh, sentiment publicly rising at the same time as the, the sort of blooming of his fascist regime. Dare I say, we're seeing echoes of, it, of, of that in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Is that a coincidence that we're seeing these two things hand in hand? Um, well, we, our argument is that um, anti-LGBTQ agenda in uh, the Russian regime is the part of everything else. So Russia um, was becoming a dictatorship, an authoritarian state. And as a part of it, as a part of the process, different tools were employed, free and fair elections were undermined, 
uh, civil society was restricted uh, and um, equal status of different societal groups was also undermined, was also uh, restricted. So it's definitely a part of the process of autocratization and becoming a less democratic state. Um, yeah, and, and obviously it's, it's difficult for us to, to watch that from afar, but doing your research, do you feel that you're, um, you're endangering yourself at all or mm. that, uh, you know, that you're restricting your ability maybe to, to, to go to Russia at, mm. at any stage or is, is that, do they not really care about research, uh, PhD research? Mm. So, yeah, the image that I showed on my slide, for example, um, that is restricted in Russia by law. So this particular image, they don't really explain how they, you know, they're going to prosecute people disseminating this image, but anyway, you can get in trouble for showing that. Um, it's definitely not an easy question to answer. So somebody referred to my project as the research in exile because we are sort of gathering this information and we're hoping that it can, you know, influence something in the future when the regime changes, but we can't do anything right now and we can't go back right now as well. So mm. it is a precarious situation. Um, Victoria, talk to me about uh, your work. Hydrogels seem very hot right now. Anytime I'm talking to somebody that seems to be working with hydrogels, um, uh, why are they of, of so, uh, um, so much interest to the scientific community? And, and uh, this hyaluronic, is that right? Acid. Yeah, once again. Acid. Is that, an, I mean, is that typically used as a hydrogel or is that a new application in your research? Sure, yeah. So hydrogels, of course, are a hot topic, but I suppose if you hear hyaluronic acid here, you're going to start hearing and seeing everywhere. It's big in the advertisement strategies for beauty and health serums. And it's because hyaluronic acid has this incredible property of behaving like human tissue. So when you see it in the like of a cream, it's because we're reintroducing something that is technically lost in our body over time, which is why it's acting so successfully in the joints, because it's replacing what is damaged and worn just with natural time and degeneration. Um, hydrogels in sense are fascinating because depending on how you manipulate them, and design them, they can match pretty much any biological tissue that you're aiming to target. So it can be a bone. I'm obviously working in the heart. And I think really there's this whole race against time, particularly with heart failure, is to find that perfect biological material to support the wall. Um, thankfully, there is initial first patient clinical trials in America and results are looking promising. But again, it's that race as to, can it be comprehensive? Is it going to be translatable across every individual, no matter how severe their heart attack is? Um, so I think as a treatment, it's something we're going to hear a lot more as we uh, proceed into the new research and medical future. Maeve, your work was on um, these uh, nano needles. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, um, when you put these on a, on a surface, because they're so small, can, can you feel the, uh, did the, did yeah, that surface no. feel any different? No, no, no it, that's it was probably part of the most heartbreaking part of my research. I never know if I've squished them until I see them under like a really big microscope or whatever. <laughs> right, you okay. literally can't, they're not, because I guess micro needles were really kind of talked about during COVID because they were a way that people were administering uh, vaccines and stuff. Um, and you can see those to a degree, but also you're not meant to feel them quite as much as a, a regular jab, let's say. Uh, but nano needles are a thousand times smaller again. So you're not like, I can't see them even under uh, a really, really strong microscope that we have in the lab, I still struggle to find them sometimes. Another heartbreaking aspect of the, the research. Um, <laughs> Spending hours going, yeah, where I are you? I like to have to like, mark them with markers just to try and figure <laughs> right, out where okay. I'm going. But yeah, no, you definitely can't feel them or anything like that. I, I, and so the, the idea is that, that these needles burst the cell uh, wall, right? Exactly. And, and, and that, I suppose, as an approach from a mechanical point of view is much favorable to uh, uh, using antibiotic resistance but obviously it's not super practical. Where do you see these surfaces being deployed in a way that will be useful for general public health? Yeah, so the, the <coughs> types of materials that I work with, I obviously in three minutes can't go into all those details, but the types of materials that I work with, some of them are biodegradable as well. So the idea would be like with the hip replacement or just even like a stent for a heart, 
um, you can cover those surfaces with these nano needles because of how small they are. And over time, so the biggest kind of risk factor is the first six weeks after surgery. After that, a chance of a bi uh, bacterial infection is much more diminished. So over time, all of those nano needles will eventually just degrade to natural products in your body. Mm. Um, so the idea is that in a way that's more targeted, you can kill bacteria at the point of surgery, which okay. is the highest risk factor, let's say. Um, okay. And then with the needles, so as like bacteria basically can adapt their own structures to try and fight antibiotics, and that's how we get antibiotic resistance. Whereas with the needles, it's pure brute force that they work by. So no matter how much, the idea is that no matter how much adaption a bacteria cell goes through, it would be very, very difficult to just not be beaten up, basically, yeah, yeah. is the idea, yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, and Mairead, uh, your work was on uh, metabolites, and also in the area of antimicrobe, um, uh, antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about these metabolites. Are they difficult to, to, to collect, to, to work with? Or like, wh what's the method of collection? So I've actually made them myself okay. in the chemistry lab. And I've used existing methods that were out there in the literature, and then I've optimized them. Because you can buy these compounds, they're readily available, but they're quite expensive for very small quantities. And to do all the micro studies that I wanted to do, I needed a lot more of them. So instead of ordering them, I made them. And then I was able to go through all these testing, like the biofilm formation and then minimum inhibitory concentration assays, which will show you if more of the antibiotic is being needed to kill the bacteria after exposure to the metabolite. So it can tell you if it's beginning to become resistant. Right, okay. And so in the wild, then uh, we imagine it'll be a slightly different and more complicated affair. Yes. So everyone, when they take antibiotics, they're producing these compounds in their bodies and then you're excreting them, and the same happens in animals. And all of these compounds then can be found in wastewater treatment or in agriculture after, say, um, following animals having antibiotics, then the manure will be used to fertilize the soil, and if it rains, so that runoff, they're all they're there. And yeah. then in high doses of antibiotics will be given to people in hospitals, so the people in hospitals will be excreting the antibiotics that are unchanged and the metabolites. Yeah. So it's... It's a big, it's, yeah, it's a big hot it's, mess it's in a way, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is yeah. one of the reasons why it's so tricky to, to treat, right? Yeah, like we, if something, if like collaborative action isn't taken across the animal, human, and environmental health um, sectors, you're going to see increasing resistance rates amongst the bacteria, and then you could end up going back to the days when a simple cook could kill you. So okay. it's really, it's important to find out more about these compounds. <laughs> cheery point to end this uh, discussion <laughs> on. Uh, thanks very much. A round of applause for our participants. Uh, you can go that way, guys. Thanks very much. Um, we did a show on Sunday about UTIs, and uh, Mary was talking about these liquids costing a lot. Um, does anyone have any idea what commercial uh, urine, human urine, uh, costs per liter? Anybody, any, any idea? Do you want to, someone throw out a number? No, it's not free. It's very expensive. For one liter of, of, of just normal urine, nothing special about it. 500 pounds sterling. There you go. New business venture there for some in the room with that murmuring. <laughs> Student money is hard to come by sometimes. Right, um, we're going to get uh, our other four our participants, please. So please welcome um, uh, Patrick, uh, Astrid, Bill, and uh, who was this here? Leanne, yes. Sorry, Leanne. Um, so, thanks very much for joining us. Well done. Um, Leanne, how did you find that? I mean, you're, are, you've done it a few times now. Are you very calm and relaxed in an environment like this? Are you no problem speaking to public audience? Absolutely not, no. The <laughs> polar opposite, as I'm sure my colleagues and friends will attest to. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it feels different every time, no matter how many times you've done it. it. It's a nice reassurance to know, okay, I can do it, but Every time you step into a new room in front of a new audience, it just feels like, oh, we're starting from scratch here again. Um, but I did find it's a really rewarding experience. Um, I, as I said, I'm terrified of public speaking, so it's very good to just get the practice. And the more times you do it, the more relaxed you become, in a sense. But um, it never yeah, really leaves never you that really little goes nerve. Away. The little, even even for me, it, it never fully mm -hmm. leaves me. And I think it's that's probably a good thing. Um, what about you, Patrick? This is is this something that you're um, used to doing, speaking in public? I think I'm more nervous about this part because it's not rehearsed. Oh, um, okay. No, uh, yeah, I think it was it was a big challenge to. It's just a matter of repetitions for me. Uh, it wouldn't be the most comfortable, 
if I'm in front of a bunch of athletes or other coaches, I'm more comfortable. But in the very formal setting or presentations or conferences, I can get quite nervous. Yeah, it's quite sure. a formal setting here with all yeah. the books and everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, very good. Um, it, Bill, talk to us a little bit about your, um, your research because you were looking at um, optimism and pessimism. It, is, is optimism a, 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 a good thing for our health generally? Firstly, I just want to say I feel like I'm in the Eurovision. It feels <laughs> incredible with the countdown going behind us. Um, but otherwise, sorry, um, distraction. Uh, optimism, it depends on what context you're looking at it in. So generally in more mental health contexts, being optimistic is a good thing. So we find that health optimists have lower depression, depressive symptoms. But um, so yeah, in a mental health context, I suppose, uh, somewhat uh, delusional optimism might be a good thing, but then if you're that, you know, overly optimistic, it might be because of cognitive impairment, or it might be because of something else that's affecting uh, your perception. So it might be on the surface a good thing, but there are underlying uh, things that are affecting it as well. Yeah, because I, I mean, being optimistic is sometimes be, is applied to things where it really doesn't work in a medical setting, right? Like, uh, I'm going to beat this cancer, you know, while a positive attitude and trying everything may be, be one thing, you know, uh, there are definitely some, sometimes we've seen in the press of reports of people saying, you know, you can just, you can just think yourself uh, well, and that's not necessarily the case. Not always, but like a healthy dose of optimism is good too. You know, mm. it's having hope and those kind of uh, more... Uh, you know, unfortunate settings. You know, there's nothing wrong with you know, a bit of perseverance and hope. But it, it's what I'm looking at is like a little different. It's um, people who are vastly over their actual health status. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, do, do you have any obviously anonymous? But do you have any interesting stories of of um, people in their 80s um, doing cliff jumps or like what is the um, you know how how well, optimistic do people go? Uh, well. I work with large data, so, okay. look, so you don't get, in, you don't get, I into, don't get into those fine details, so I'm a bit removed from it. Right, okay. Um, but I imagine some skateboarding accidents. And, <laughs> yeah. Very good. Um, uh, Astrid, talk to me about um, the, the birds that you're uh, working with. Um, is it easier to know how many birds and what species of birds are passing through a particular area? Is that very well established by now? Uh, no. Uh, bird movement is dependent on many things like species um, or just prey avail availability um, and that changes the marine environment is just so vast uh, there may be a big shoal of fish in one area one day and the next day it's like 200 kilometers north so or north um, <laughs> so there's no real way of knowing there are, there are patterns there are some areas that some species tend to prefer over others um, and then we can make predictions, you know, predictions of uh, fish movement, prediction of anything really, of weather patterns, which does affect movement as well. Um, for example, this year, the puffins didn't really go very far, whereas they went some distance in 2021. So there was a difference there that we just, we don't, we don't know what it was yet. So it could just be the fish was closer that this year. Um, yeah, so it's, it's tough to know. Uh, um do the do the birds? I mean, you know, you could have a we have a glass um, thing looking over, over our garden at home, and every once in a while, a bird would just bang straight into it, you know, um, which is upsetting for everyone. Usually, they're fine; they fly off. Do bird when a bird sees a big like uh, wind turbine, does it know this is really dangerous, or do you have you know do birds really have awful outcomes when they're anywhere near these things? So it's hard to know for sure because you would have to just be at the turbine in the middle of the ocean with binoculars and be like, oh, what's this bird going to do? Um, so some bird species are actually attracted to wind farms just because they provide like a, a platform for them to roost on. Okay. Um, so for species like uh, cormorants or shags, um, it allows them potentially, this is speculation, but maybe allows them to go further because they need a platform to just dry their wings. If that platform is like on land, they have to go back to land. So it means that they can't go as far. Um, Gulls, some gulls seem to be attracted to them as well. Um, others avoid them entirely, like uh, some diver or loon species. Um, for other species, it's kind of 
unknown because it hasn't been well studied. Right. Um, is there a particular species that you think of that, um, that you feel because of the way they move, where they live, and where the plans of this, um, these wind, wind turbines and wind farms are going to be that are in particular risk? Um, so it depends on the wind farm. It just depends on so many things, and it's very site-specific. But for example, if a species like puffins, uh, they don't go very far. So if you put wind farms all around their colony that they have to keep going back to to feed their chicks, they have a, what's called a, a high wing loading capacity. So they have fat bodies and short wings. So it costs them a lot to fly. Right. So if they have to go around it, it costs them a lot, a lot more than for a bird like a gannet, who can fly a lot further on the same amount of um, food intake, for example. Mm. Um, so, so it is just very. It really is very dependent. Yeah, very site specific and species specific, unfortunately. Yeah, um, Patrick, I, I, that first line. I was just thinking when you said it. I was like, that is a funny line, but we are not ready to laugh Too about soon. The, uh, Too soon. the World Cup yet. <laughs> um, talk to me about um, the, this 15 minutes because I'm currently dealing with issues in my back um, as a result of sport industry, and I was like, I'm going to have a chat with Patrick. So uh, let's do that now. Um, I'll just lie down. You can just tell me what I'm doing wrong. No. Uh, this 15 minute um, program, is it for, is it, is, does it work on core? Is it uh, muscle strengthening or what is it a mixture of and is it freely accessible to people or are you still refining it? Yeah, uh, glad to have this question I suppose uh, and I, I guess I'll just preface it with part of, I suppose, putting the thesis in three, not only is it challenging but it's almost, can you try and give them enough but also leave a little bit of a cliffhanger, like I don't quite get into what the program is. Um, but yeah, it's essentially um, some people that maybe aren't in the coaching or physio or S&C side of things might look at it and just see it as kind of a, a warm-up or a preparation period for sport, per particularly in this case rugby, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a series of three phases. Uh, it takes approximately 15 minutes to um, get through. The first phase is really just kind of your general locomotion, increased heart rate, increased core temperature, which would be suitable for preparation for any uh, activity, physical activity. The second one is a little bit more that targeted the areas that I found prone to or susceptible to injury. So it's a series of four different targeted strength exercises um, that kind of really target the shoulder, the knee, the hip, the ankle, uh, and the head and neck uh, that were obviously specific to some of the data that I found in the research. Uh, and then the, the third phase is a little bit more performance uh, specific. So. Rugby, in this case, obviously, is a, a contact-heavy, but also a speed-heavy uh, sport and dominant. So um, there's some elements of, of that in there as well. And all of that with a little bit of kind of flexibility and autonomy left to the coach and player on how they implement it, which I think fed into a lot of why I had some good compliance with the program. Okay, great. Yeah, it sound, the results sound fantastic. Um, Leanne, tell me a little bit about... Um, this the research in the immune system because it seems to me that the immune system more and more as i do the, the radio program it seems to be core to almost f solving every problem that we have in the body it's just turning its volume down or turning the volume up in particular particular areas mm -hmm. how difficult is it to tinker with our immune system safely uh incredibly i would say um yeah the immune system it is integral to all processes and as i was saying as we have such a complex immune system it does really depend on the degree to which certain responses are mounted and you can't take one immune cell out of the context of the milieu that it operates within. So uh, that can even pose challenges to studying the immune cells. Um, for example, I would work on a particular cell type, but the behavior that I may see in a dish might be completely different to how it will behave in the body on encountering a similar material that I'd be testing. So um, it is obviously a vital component of how we operate and um, it is quite difficult to get that sweet spot in terms of let's manipulate it but keep it at a level that that is is safe to do so um, you get your blood from donors it's waste product from the irish blood transfusion service exactly yeah. um, tell me a little bit about that that process and uh, and why that's a, a, a huge a really valuable resource for you it's brilliant it and um, we as um you said we do get waste products from the blood transfusion service so these would be people that have given donations, uh, the blood has been used for the purposes that it can be used for, and the rest will just uh, either has expired or the components can't be used and will be thrown out. So we're actually able to take them into a research lab. We um, process the blood to isolate the cells of interest, uh, and we're able to work on those. And this really gives us an insight into 
the behavior of human immune cells. A lot of studies are done using mouse or um, even rat, etc. But uh, this allows us to kind of translate that research to a more human level. And also, and this can be quite frustrating, uh, it shows us the human variability that exists amongst the natural population. So um, we do our experiments on a range of anonymized healthy donors to get an idea of how the human immune system will respond in, in a general context. And of course, um, uh, uh, you know, using biomaterials mm -hmm. uh, and putting, you know, foreign bodies in, uh, in a hip or a knee to try and improve function, um, the immune system typically doesn't like that. Mm -hmm. um, why is that when, when we are dealing with something maybe like a, a, a completely sterile hip joint? What is it exactly the immune system is rejecting if there's no organic material there for it to have, a, have, a, have an issue with? It's, that's kind of where the integration of immunology into tissue engineering and into biomaterial research has, has come because for many years or traditionally biomaterials have been designed to be biologically inert as in exactly as you said integrate within a body and elicit minimal response but as time has gone on we've become to appreciate that well actually your immune system does have a response regardless and we know that um, they're not just responding to infectious agents. So in the case of an entirely sterile material, they do um, have very good mechanosensing properties. So in the case of, let's say, the particles that I work on, the immune cells are actually capable of seeing this is a big particle. I have to use this process to uh, interact with it, or this is a small particle. I'll use a different process. And right. that's the kind of tells them to do different things. So the, so the, 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 the approach is to sort of trick the body into thinking this is a natural thing by coding it sometimes with these materials exactly. or are sending the right chemical signals? Yes, so the materials themselves, so in the case of, let's say, hip replacements, the particles that I work on are calcium phosphate based, which is a similar composition to bone. So the whole idea would be that your immune system or your body would see that and go, oh, this is bone, but there is still a response to that material. So the goal is to give it a bone mimetic particle that has a property that also gives it an instruction to not reject this, but in fact mount a response that will enhance its integration and then signal to other cells, okay, let's start growing more of this in this spot. Very good. Um, Bill, um, in your work, you know, you were looking at positive and, and uh, pe pessimistic and optimistic um, older people and, and the impact that might have on their health. What are the next steps for you? Uh, so I am in my final year, my fourth year, and there's, I suppose, one study left that um, we're tracking health anxiety across a very short period of time in people over the age of 50. So define health anxiety. So people who have uh, a lot of concern um, about their health and are hypochondriac too, typically, or, or yeah, um, yeah, basically. Um, so like older adults typically tend to be, um, as I was saying, you know, overly optimistic or pessimistic, but there's very few, or there's not enough research really on how that might change over a short period of time. So the study that we're doing is uh, getting people to download an app on their phone and they'll get a ping in the morning and a ping in the evening. And when they see the notification, they will click the app and they'll respond to like two or three questions. And then over like a six day period, we can see how things go up and down. And if someone's a bit like naturally more realistic about their health, is their health anxiety constant? Or health pessimists are expecting is that it's gonna be quite up and down depending on, oh, I feel sore in my leg right now, uh, so my health anxiety is spiked mm. tonight, or it's gone down. And we're currently recruiting participants, so if anyone is over the age of 50, shameless plug, uh, you can... Would you like to help research, important Please. research? Um, uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. You can approach um, a Bill after it. I, 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 you know, when it comes to health anxiety, I think when, once you get over 45, anything that happens, the first thing you think to yourself is, is it cancer? And then you go, no, of course it's not, probably, probably not cancer. You're probably going to be fine. But that, uh, once you get over 40 something, that's my, always my question. It's like, the slight discoloration. <laughs> it's not good. Um, Tell me what this, this process has been like, Astrid. I mean, uh, taking part in this, <laughs> in, this, um, in this program, has it helped you um, understand your research better or has it helped you uh, perhaps think about how to communicate it to others? Yeah, it's helped me kind of look at the bigger picture as well. Because um, when you get into it, my day-to-day my -day at the moment, when I'm not on field work, is just sitting at my desk and coding, basically. Um, so you get really, you fall down a rabbit hole of, code and being like, oh no, what's going wrong? And then you just take a step back and 
summarize what it is that you're trying to achieve and you kind of you know, realize the importance of it as well. Um, it's a great way to communicate to your family. Um, I feel like PhDs are always very tough to explain. Um, no, mom, I don't have lectures. Um, you know, <laughs> this is what I'm actually doing. Um, it's a great way to, to interact with the general public. And I feel like from my own research, it's something that's very relevant to people, even in their day-to-day -day lives, you know, like Do energy. you find that people are really engaged with your research because everybody loves birds, except for seagulls, they're the rats of the sky. But, um. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, I feel like everyone is kind of uh, sensitive to the issues around climate change, um, but then maybe not as aware as, um, as aware as, um, to the um, solutions uh, to kind of tackle climate change. So when I talk about wind farms, you know, people may think that they're, uh, you know, amazing and have zero flaws, and then I'm like, you know, yes, they're great and they're needed. Um, but, you know, there are things to consider as well. Um, and I, I like to think that I make people think about these issues as well. So I'm going to ask nice. you a judgment question. So there's no real right or wrong answer. Um, but do you feel that the ecological case for a single species or two species will ever outweigh the heavy demand we now have for offshore wind farm? And considering that there are so many different aspects to consider, do you think the the protection of our bird species is going to be something that gets in the way of the heavy demand we have for building these wind farms? Uh, I think it, it can, yes. So there has been a project in the UK, I think over 10 years ago now, a 1.3 billion pound project that was scraped over fear for, for birds. Um, so it is a concern. Mm. Um, this is a solution that's supposed to uh, positively impact the environment. So if we kind of like disregard and discredit the in negative impacts that it will have, it kind of discredits the whole kind of initiative. Mm. Um, every offshore wind farm developer has guidelines they need to meet, um, environmental impact assessments that they need to hand in, where they study the uh, sites that they're interested in. Um, so there is like a site-specific aspect to it as well. So it's never going to be perfect, um, but it's, it's not an aspect that's going to be overlooked. Um, it'll have to go ahead yeah. because there is a need for it, yeah. uh, but hopefully we can kind of like try to make the two work together. Yeah, big time, yeah. Um, uh, Bill, talk to me about what you've learned over this, um, this preparation, taking part of this competition, and why you think science communication is important. I think the biggest thing that I learned was not, not everything is important to tell a story, so I, by practicing for this competition and competing at Maynooth and then here, I'm able to weed out any information that might seem important to me, but that's because I, you know, I, I'm doing this five days a week. Mm. Uh, so it was good practice to be able to acknowledge what is important for uh, non-academics to understand, and then also being able to condense it down into you know, everyday language that's the whole idea of this contest. So it, would, it helped me look at my research in a very applied sense. Mm. Why, do, why does everyone here care about this? Um, and that's not something that... It, it, um, some, maybe some PhD students are thinking about that, but it's certainly what I wasn't in my first or second year. I was worried about the technical, the statistics. Uh, how do I code all of this? Yeah. So it took me out of that, and it helped me realize, well, at the end of the day, there's some sort of application for everybody on a day-to-day -day basis and that helped me focus on that. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I do a lot of work training scientists on communicating their work and uh, the scientist typically wants to hoard their data and they want to, when someone, so they want to tell people about their work, they say, here's all of the information, uh, here's every number I have now, are you convinced? And um, when we reflect on the learnings from COVID, as, as uh, Philip Nolan will know, of course, um, just giving people numbers doesn't really help um, uh, move people. And actually, if you want to, to, to get change of behavior or change of thought, that you need to, to, for sure, provide data, but you need to tell a story with that, with that information. And it was only, I think, when it came to COVID, it was only when we started telling the stories of things that happened, like that GAA coach, um, was it Cork or Mayo, who went to Tenerife and came back and then 
got his whole um, his whole team infected, and we went, oh, okay, this is this 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 is a bad thing. And oh, that person that person went to dinner, and everyone at the restaurant got COVID. Maybe I shouldn't go to dinner so often. And so we started only by visualizing getting these stories. We realized that actually. Um, behavior and thought change happens. And I think this is what was great about this competition is that you have three minutes to really tell a story. And what was fantastic about all of them is the numbers were few and far between. And actually using data, powerful data sparingly is really a key to general science communication um, and, and getting people to want to know more. So yeah, absolutely brilliant, Bill. Um, Leanne, what have you gotten out of this competition? Well, I kind of built it on, I guess, from what Bill was saying and what you were just saying there, really being able to kind of stick, take a step back from the minutiae of the data. You spend every single day at the lab bench or on the computer getting really lost in the weeds and dealing with the numbers and the graphs and things that don't really translate in a real world context or to a, a range, a range of um, audiences. So I've been able to, from this competition, take a step back, really distill down, okay, what is it that the ultimate goal of the research is? It's not the developing, you know, a color changing test one day. It is using that information and applying it to a real world context or putting it into the context of why it is important. And um, the three minute timer, as scary as having it <laughs> in your face may be, uh, also gives you the opportunity to distill it down in a concise way. So uh, I myself would have a bit of a tendency to ramble. So this really got me kind of thinking clearly, OK, what is the important information to impart? What could be cut? What are people not interested in? And what is or may be engaging to an audience? Yeah, what's that phrase? I would have written you uh, a long, a, a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. Mm. Yes. Um, Patrick, what, what did you get from this particular um, uh, a, a process uh, and, and standing up here telling people about your research today? Yeah, a lot of agreeable answers here um, from Bill and Leanne, but I think in reflecting now while they're talking, as well as throughout this process of the first iterations of, of kind of writing this script, it almost reminded me of maybe why I got into research in the first place. For me, it was about making an immediate impact with my athletes or with my coaches or whatever community I was kind of working in. And the first iterations of the script that you start to write down and you realize how much time that's actually gonna take and you have to get rid of all the details that are necessary to get to the point in your PhD and it's frustrating because yeah. you're the only <laughs> one that really appreciates, I think, uh, a lot of those steps. But um, yeah, I think it just reminded me that I think no matter what space or subject matter uh, your research is in, we're all here trying to make an impact in whatever our community is, obviously the, the wider Irish community in this case particularly, but um, yeah, so it's just, I think it's rewarding to, uh, you know, reflect back on your work and see all the different great impacts that all of us are, um, you know, making, and a lot of us, uh, all of us even uh, interdisciplinary as well, and just the collaboration that it takes to really make a, an impact in the community is awesome to see. Great. So if you haven't voted, please do vote. Uh, Slido.com, if you're watching at home, you've joined us a little bit late. I hope you're voting, having seen um, uh, some of the talks. Uh, you can Slido.com, enter the code 3714912. Uh, our judges are coming. They are taking a long time. That's not surprising. It's such great participants. Um, but just before we go, Patrick, could you tell us why we lost the World Cup? <laughs> <laughs> I only got, to, I was working and I only got to watch the last 10 minutes, but it was, uh, it was, it was gutting. Uh, no, I have no comment. Okay, still, no, still going to go watch. Probably it, safe, like. actually. It could, uh, <laughs> uh, it could go horribly wrong. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our other four participants, please round of applause for them. So um, if I can get you up here, Jim, please, the chair of the panel. Um, and we'll just talk a little bit about that. So uh, that should be on, Jim. Just have it. Hello. Yeah, yes. can we hear? Yeah, great. Uh, so tell me a little bit about that process, because we gave you ideally 20 minutes. You were almost 40. <laughs> um, well, I think um, if my uh, fellow judges had been given latitude, they, they would have prevailed upon me um, to have more than two prizes uh, yeah. for this. <laughs> um, it was extremely difficult. And I know in a lot of these processes you hear that. But I, I can tell you. Um, there's a perception, you know, about academics and about research that, um, that it's very convoluted and complicated and inaccessible to ordinary folk like me. Um, but I think the eight uh, competitors today disprove that in spades. 
um, they translated what were in all cases extremely complex um, uh, scientific and sociological and, and various other discipline related uh, endeavors into completely understandable uh, um, and compelling uh, and compelling stories, yeah. I mean, really and the, the, the communications performance from all eight of them was terrific um, uh, so the problem was um, the problem was finding flaws yeah. uh, frankly uh, and there weren't many to find um, so in terms of you know we we have we we managed after and a good part of the first part of the process was trying to come into a top four and that took quite a long time which mm. will show you the overall standard and then it took an even longer process to have that again into a one and a, well into a two and we still had a, a discussion at the end the scores were extremely close um, across the board and particularly um, for the top two yeah. Uh, and I think in terms of the, 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 the winners, um, uh, you know, I think it, it was little elements in the end that made the difference. Yeah. Um, the little edge they had on, on the PowerPoint slide, um, the little anecdote or the little turn of phrase that they may have had in the pre presentation are, the, are the, just the compelling message about how they um, uh, translated, you know, the 80,000 words into uh, 20 words that, that we could understand. Yeah. Um, so I think it was extraordinary. Um, and uh, I, we just, all of my, my, my fellow judges, Jenny, Orla, Philip, and Danny, uh, we'd really like to congratulate all of them. Um, you're making some history today. You're the first ever um, uh, national winner of the thesis in three competition and that will never be taken away from you but there will be a second one because we're going to run this every year um, so we just want to thank you for participating and uh, I know at this stage the audience at home have already had their sandwiches and soup um, people around here are hungry <laughs> so uh, we we'll leave it at that very good yeah because people do want to know who um, who is going to walk away the winner of this competition so I have the envelope in front of me we're going to do it this way we're going to do runner-up first uh, uh, we're going to do runner-up first and we're going to do then um, uh, the audience choice and the overall winner so can I get all the judges up on stage please so Whenever I'm on the side um, of the stage, I'm always trying to see, can I see the name early on the side? Okay, uh, so please, um, we have all of our judges, thank you very much. So uh, we're gonna do a photograph. So when your name uh, is announced, if you can uh, go up, and then Jason, our, um, our photographer, will tell you exactly where to sit. So uh, the runner up for the three minute thesis, IUA national final is Victoria Ward. Congratulations, well done. Thank you very Well done, Victoria. Congratulations. Our Audience Choice Award winner for the three-minute thesis IUA National Final is Leanne Shanley. Congratulations, well done. Well done, Leah. Uh, 
And the winner of this, the first uh, of many IUA national final of the three-minute thesis is... Get attention. <laughs> Leanne Shanley. <laughs> Well done, congratulations. Well done, Leanne. So, uh, agreement from the judges. Uh, judges, we may need you for photographs, so don't go too far, please. Uh, agreement from the judges uh, and from uh, our audience as well. Uh, so that's a good sign, at least. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I hope you had uh, a really good day, and congratulations once again to all of our participants. We're going to get all the uh, participants up on stage to get photographs, if that's okay. If you are uh, currently undertaking a, a thesis, uh, and would like to enter. Uh, we will be doing this again next year. We'd love to have you take part. Um, we're going to now hand over some uh, awards to all of the finalists. So all the finalists up on stage. For everyone else, thank you so much.